Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Greetings to all of you today in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Eric Ishimaru, and on behalf of Christ the King Lutheran Church, we would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you here today. We gather today for three reasons. First, to give thanks for the life of Betty Jane Larson. We celebrate who she was and who she is. Betty was a force of life to all those around her. Throughout her long life, she enhanced and beautified her surroundings and all those who knew her. She has blessed all of us, and for that, our gathering today is a feast of gratitude. Secondly, we come to grieve. Now, before she departed from our earthly realm, Betty told me, I want it to be happy. That's a direct quote. I wrote it down and I made sure that Betty saw me write that down. Trust me, Betty will get her wish today. It will be a happy day. But we have lost somebody most dear to us, and it is natural for us to grieve. Most assuredly, grief eventually gives way to joy. As the psalm says, weeping lasts for the night, but joy comes with the morning. And God is the God of all comfort. So along with your grief, Take great comfort in this. Betty belonged to Jesus Christ, and because of that, we can grieve, but not as the world grieves. We can also be happy that Betty has finally made it home. Thirdly, we come today to hear some very good news, and that is what Christ has done about this thing called death. Jesus Christ has given His life and has paid for the destiny of those who trust in Him, binding His promise with His own blood. He has furnished proof of his victory over our sin, over death, and over the devil by rising from the dead. It is because of Jesus Christ that today we don't have to wonder where Betty is or how to get to heaven. Christ Jesus has made the way and is himself the way. There is hope beyond the grave and an eternity of happy tomorrows for those who put their trust in him alone. This is the good news that we come to hear. One last thing, Uh, Betty wanted all of us to take something home today, and so downstairs you will find stacks of pink and purple pens that read, Trust in the Lord. Betty wanted to make sure that you knew that, and so please pick up an official Betty Larson Trust in the Lord pen before you leave today. At this time, please take a moment to check your phones and or other electronic devices and set them to the silent mode. And please rise as you are able for the invocation, the procession, and the start of worship proper. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. In holy baptism, Betty was clothed with the robe of Christ's righteousness that covered all her sin. St. Paul says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. You're invited to please turn in your hymnals to uh, the red hymnal, hymn 358, and please sing along with Greta and Kyle, Because He Lives. Savior lives because 
as he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fears gone because I know be seated. The greatest comfort of all at times like this comes from God's own Word, and we have abundant scriptures today to give us assurance and peace in the face of our loss. The first of those words is from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 51 through 58, where he talks about what will await us upon our death and what awaits us in a future world of a new heavens and new earth and our resurrected bodies. 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. At this time, we'll hear a few reflections and a brief uh, bio on uh, the life and legacy of Betty Jane Larson. I'm uh, Josh Witt, uh, one of Betty's grandchildren, uh, Julie's oldest of five. Betty Jane Larson, age 96, died peacefully at her home with her family by her side, January 26, 2024. Betty was born on May 6, 1927, in Deer Park, Wisconsin, the daughter of Alfred and Nellie Bowe. Betty grew up on a dairy farm, graduating from Amory High School in 1945. In her childhood, she lived without electricity until the age of 10. Then when Betty left for college at 18, she finally experienced living with an indoor toilet, running water, and a bathtub. She attended the University of Wisconsin, River Falls, receiving her bachelor's and teaching degree in 1948. While in River Falls, she met Spencer Levi Larson, her handsome sailor. They married April 1st, 1950 in Deer Park, Wisconsin. Both were teachers in Ellsworth, Wisconsin, before welcoming twin daughters, Lynn and Lori, in 1953. Betty left teaching to raise her new family, and Spencer went to work for Alice Chalmers. This adventure took them to Marshall, Minnesota, where Julie, Joel, and Scott were born. They then lived in Huron, South Dakota, and Little Falls, Minnesota, until 1964 when they moved to Wasika. As the new owner-operators of the Wasika Dairy Queen, Betty served as co-owner and co-manager with unquestioned equal partnership and business with Spencer. As an important member of the Wasika community, she influenced, mentored, counseled numerous employees and patrons. She and Spencer always had time for those who arrived after the business had closed, who just needed a trusted friend to talk to. Betty cherished her 18 years running the Dairy Queen with a capacity for work that was unrivaled. She remained active in the community, volunteering for the Wasika County Fair Board, substitute teaching, and also teaching reading in the prison reading program. Betty accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior at the age of 12. Her faith was a firm foundation, and she wanted to know and love God more and more. She went to church and participated in Bible studies her entire life, even up to the age of 96. She loved God and God's people. She was active at uh, Grace Lutheran Church and was a founding member of this church, Christ the King. Her extraordinary love was expressed through her gifts of hospitality, her written words, and showing up. Her home was always welcoming and full of love, life, and laughter. She valued the written word with notes, cards, Christmas poems, and recognizing important days and moments in the lives of others. She understood the importance of showing up whether it was dance recitals, graduations, weddings, sporting events, family gatherings, or simply a cup of coffee with her neighbors. Betty was a flower girl, always surrounded by flowers and plants which she tended and nurtured. She loved birds, gardening, fishing, and springtime, which she called the season of new life. Betty greeted every day as a joyful gift from God, and she lived it with optimism and gratitude. She leaves her family and friends with a legacy of faith, honesty, courage, love, and joy. The last lines of a recent poem she wrote is her goodbye to us. Miss me a little, be a bit sad, just remember the wonderful life that I've had. Betty was preceded in death by her beloved spouse, Spencer Larson, her cherished daughters, Lori Messina, Julie Witt, her parents, Alfred and Nellie Bowe, her brother Danny and her sister Daisy. She is survived by her daughter Lynn Gronert, her sons Scott and Joel Larson, Joel's wife Shelley, her brother Benny, her sister Faye, and uh, her 13 grandchildren and 18 great-grandchildren. Thank you. The next uh, couple of scripture readings that we have here 
really are a portrayal of Betty's life, the ideals that she um, aspired to and uh, the guiding principles, I think, of, of her life. And you'll see some of her character reflected in these two passages. The first is from the epistle of St. Paul to the Philippians, chapter 4, and the second is from the first epistle of St. John, chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 1 John 4. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. At this time we'll hear a song Betty's request, the song One Day at a Time.
one day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I ask of you. For it gives me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Lord, help me today and show me the way one day. Show me the way one day at a time. Well, Betty did not tell me that I had to try to channel my inner Merle Haggard, but she would have been pleased with that, I think. <laughs> gospel readings for today are from the Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter, and then John, the 11th chapter. John 14, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then John chapter 11. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And now please uh, enjoy and hear the song In the Garden, sung by Greta and Kyle. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice The birds hush their singing And the melody that he gave to me Within my heart is ringing And he walks with me And he talks with me And he tells me I am joy we share as we tarry 
talks with me and he tells me I hear his wrong in the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Thank you, Greta and Kyle. And uh, I, I didn't acknowledge her uh, previously. I'm sorry about that. But uh, thank you, Marilyn Wilkes, for uh, just a beautiful solo. It's really a joy uh, rehearsing and, and working on the song with you. Thank you for your offering. The Lord be with you. I remember uh, getting the news from a church member Betty Larson is back home from Nevada, and I was really glad to hear that. Betty has been such a wonderful presence in the 14-year-old life of this church, 14 years old, which means that uh, this church is an adolescent in terms of the life of the church, and adolescents really do best when there's not just one generation ahead of them, but maybe two or three. And so I think, uh, appropriately, we could say that Betty Larson was the great-grandmother of our church, and she filled that role perfectly. So I rejoiced when I heard that Betty was back in town. But the next sentence I heard was this, she's at home in hospice care, and my heart sank. And that meant that the church and I would no longer be blessed by Betty's presence, her gracious presence, and her radiant personality here in our services and in the fellowship of our church. I am so grateful, however, to have had some personal time with Betty, some personal visits during her last few weeks, and to visit and to get to know and love her family. And may the Lord bless all of you today and give you His grace and peace and comfort. I guess you might have to be a pastor to appreciate this or to experience something like this, but there are ways that uh, we perceive or feel the presence of certain people in the congregation, even on a Sunday morning during a, a regular service. It, it makes all the difference in the world for us preachers uh, who is out there and who happens to be worshiping and, and, and listening. Uh, sometimes we get into our sermons and we find our pace and we can just feel the congregation coming along for the ride and, and uh, leaning into the message and, and, and wanting more. Sometimes we pastors feel that. Other times when the sermon isn't going well, we feel like we're just dragging a huge load of rocks. <laughs> uh, but with Betty here, uh, uh, even on those occasions, uh, and there have been a few where I felt like I was dragging rocks, it just made the load lighter to know that she was there and to just be able to glance right over into that, that uh, back central portion on this side and see her smiling face. And no matter what, she would always be ready afterward with a uh, smile. She would greet me warmly and lovingly. Um, what a gift it has been to me and to all of her friends here at Christ the King. Uh, Betty's preference was the later service, which is at 10.45 in the morning. But during the summer months when we moved that service to Wednesday evenings at 6.30, Betty would be there most nights, and she would hang around afterward when the root beer floats came around. Because once you're a Dairy Queen, you're always a Dairy Queen, right? <laughs> and the amazing thing about her was that she never seemed tired even as the fellowship time um, went into the, the later uh, minutes and hours of the evening, she just did not seem to get tired. I think Betty just loved being around people. And that was one of her gifts, just showing up and being there for you. Uh, in fact, I'm told uh, by Betty's daughter, Lynn, and uh, we heard it earlier in, in uh, uh, the life and legacy of, of Betty Larson, that just showing up was one of the three big ways in which she expressed love. These were Betty's love languages. First, hospitality, making people feel at home. 
Second, writing, and you've already heard a sample of that. Betty was good with words and she excelled at writing cards and poems. And third, just showing up. These are the ways Betty has expressed what we heard just a few minutes ago and actually what we heard in one of our scripture readings. And once again, I quote 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. This time not in the King James English, but in something a little bit more accessible for us. Dear friends, since God has so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And then skipping down to verse 16, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Now think about these verses for a moment. Beloved, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is a true statement, and most people would agree that uh, whether they happen to be believers or not, that, yeah, we, we should love other people. The problem is how easy it is to, for example, imagine a sermon based on what we ought to do, what we ought to do. In fact, we can imagine it so well that that's probably why some people avoid coming to church, because they fully expect to hear a message on what they ought to do. <laughs> In fact, um, uh, I, I think that that is... Uh, perhaps the death knell of many well-intentioned sermons, a sermon on oughts. We don't want to be nagged about what we ought to do. Chances are pretty good in many of those situations. We already know what we're supposed to do. But the next line of this passage ought to really make us think. John tells us no one has seen God ever. And that might be confusing for some of you Bible scholars and theologians out there because when John was a disciple of Jesus, in fact, he, uh, it seems that he was Jesus' closest friend, John tells us in so many words that Jesus was God in human flesh. And in fact, he tells us in his gospel that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son of God, Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so, how is it that John says, no one has ever seen God? What is he telling us? What's his point in saying that? Well, he's telling us that apart from Jesus becoming a visible man, God is, in fact, invisible to us. We cannot see him. But then John goes on. He says, but if we have love for one another. God lives in us, and His love is made complete in us. And that is an astounding claim. Astounding because if that is true, then when we truly love and demonstrate that love to others, it's as though we make God complete, visible once again. The invisible God becomes visible through our acts of love. This is the incarnational nature of the Christian faith. For those who are Christ's followers, God lives in us, and when we are walking with God, we love others, and when we love others, God's love comes full circle. It is made complete and whole and full. It is made incarnate, and God is revealed he is masked in our flesh and in our actions, but He shows up. Keep that in mind as you think about Betty's three love languages, three ways in which God was revealed through Betty. Hospitality, gracious words, and just showing up. But today is really about more than Betty's love languages. What we celebrate today is not that Betty is a wonderful and awesome person or even a godly person, although Betty was all those things and much, much more. We could talk even more about Betty. We could eulogize Betty even more because there is so much praiseworthy in her long life. I hope we do exactly that during the reception. But all of this praise and celebration would be no more than a remembrance, a memorial service, if you will, and even this sermon would not be anything else than a you ought to, if not for the true reason 
why this can be the kind of funeral Betty wanted. Remember what she told me, I want it happy. It's happy because God showed up. Just showing up is one of the love languages of God. In fact, he knows and is the author of all those love languages, but just showing up is one of his languages. And so we can celebrate today and be happy because God in Christ showed up. He showed up the day that Betty was baptized, and, and that's why you see reminders of her baptism here today. The banner and the baptismal font proclaim her status as a baptized child of God. The candle that you see here at the head of the casket is actually an Easter candle. We light that at Easter time. And that reminds us that on the day that Betty was baptized, as the Scripture teaches, all of her sin, her original sin and actual sins, all of them, past, present, and future, were washed away by the power of God's Word working through the water of baptism. And so what happened at Betty's baptism was the old self died and the new self was raised to newness of life with Jesus Christ, just as Jesus was raised from the dead, even so those who are baptized into Christ are raised with him to newness of life. God showed up and performed that baptism. And God showed up throughout Betty's life. On the day of her wedding, he showed up. Throughout her marriage, he showed up. Throughout her family life, through every hard time and happy time, God showed up. The Lord Jesus showed up over and over again. And I'm sure many of you can share abundant stories about those occasions in her life. God showed up. He showed up whenever Betty was in church and the word was preached and the sacrament was offered. He showed up once again when Betty was in hospice and at the moment of her passing, when Jesus made good on his promise, and we will hear that again in a few minutes, the promise that is in the 23rd Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's the Scripture's way of showing, yes, I'll show up at that moment. This is the same Jesus who showed up when Martha and her sister Mary were grieving at the tomb of their brother Lazarus. They thought Jesus showed up late, but it was because he was supposedly late that a miracle happened. Lazarus had been dead for four days. You'd think that Jesus could have healed him and maybe prevented all of this, but Jesus came, Lazarus had been in the tomb, and Jesus was right on time to perform a miracle. It was on this occasion that he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. This is why this is a happy day. Because the truth is that Betty did believe in Jesus, that he is the Son of God and that he is the resurrection and life. And so Jesus did raise Lazarus on that day. And as for us, we know that Jesus' promise wasn't just for Martha. It is for us because three days after his own crucifixion, Jesus triumphed over death and the grave by rising and then just showing up to the disciples and to more than 500 people before his ascension. And we ask, why did Jesus do it? Why did he go through all that? Why did he suffer death, being tortured, beaten and rejected, and ultimately being nailed to a cross? To die of asphyxiation and bleed his life out in a most painful and horrendous way. Why did he do that? Well, it wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was love, love for all humanity love for each of us personally and individually is what held Jesus there on the cross and it is his love that Jesus accomplished for us what we could not do for ourselves 
He severed the Gordian knot that tied us to our sins and took those sins upon himself and removed them far from us. He beat Satan at his own game by allowing him to enter wicked human beings who did their worst to him, only to reveal that those wicked people had simply played out the plan of God to save humanity. And he destroyed death by himself entering death and destroyed it from the inside out. Now, for those who believe death is nothing but a broken shell that cannot possibly hold us. When Betty entered those gates of death last Friday, she entered to the discovery that for the believer in Christ, death is momentary. And the gates are just gates. That's all that is left of this vast and dark domain of terror, of death. Now, they are gates of paradise. And that's why we can be happy and why we can even laugh today. That's why Paul can quote Scripture and trash talk death as he does in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, death, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? That's the only reason we can have hope and happiness on a day like today. And that's the only reason we can hear words like, we ought to love one another. It's because Christ first loved us. And because sin, death, and the devil are all defeated and empty foes for the Christian. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But he then asks Martha this question. Do you believe this? And that's not a question just for her. That's a question for all of us. Do you believe this? If Betty could speak for herself today, this is what she would tell you. She would say, it's all true, and it's all for you. I know that from my very last visit with Betty that she was looking forward to an eternity where she would not only be with Jesus, but where she could be reunited with her family and with her loved ones, having us all there with her. Doesn't that just sound like Betty? Having us all there with her. That's what she would love. And so I will tell you all today, believe these promises of Jesus. Believe as Betty did. And by believing and putting your trust in Christ, I can give you this final exhortation today in view of eternity. Just show up. Amen. Let us pray. Will you please rise at this time as you are able? Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, we praise you for you have so generously provided hope and assurance and a future for Betty Larson. And you shall keep her safely with you until that great day when all the saints who have fallen asleep and all who are awake shall be raised in the body and enjoy fellowship with you in the new heavens and earth you have planned for your beloved. Thank you for all you have done for Betty, and thank you for proclaiming to us once again the foundation of our future hope. As Betty has pointed to you, Lord Jesus, so point us all toward you. Speak to every heart today so that we hear your gracious invitation to believe and to trust you for a future hope that never ends. Our loving Heavenly Father, keep us in everlasting fellowship with all who wait for you on earth and with all in heaven who are with you now. For you are the resurrection and the life, even Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, please turn to, in your red hymnals, to hymn number 581, "'Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus," and we'll sing verses 1 and 4.
now receive the benediction, the blessing of the Lord. Lord bless you, and you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. As we begin the recessional, we invite you to join together in reading the 23rd Psalm that you will find in your bulletins. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of 